Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you tonight? <laughs> Everybody's been sitting down for a long time, so if you want to stand up, please stand up and stretch your legs. Joanna is not here right now, so we have Dr. Megan and Mrs. Wilson or Michelle. Yep. If anybody has any questions, raise your hand. I'll come over to you and you can ask the questions and I'll give you the microphone. Um, I uh, had two big questions for especially physical therapy. As one is um, often uh, insurances are starting to not cover if you don't prove improvement. Um, oh, and is there any way around that and getting covered um, even though because we fluctuate, fluctuate uh, we do improve and then we have setbacks and, then, and so how can we get that covered? And the other question is once those uh, vertical uh, facet joints are lined up um, and ribs are lined up, how do we maintain that alignment? Thank you. Sure. So um, in terms of coverage, it, it, that's a slippery sort of difficult question because everybody's insurance plan is different. Um, that's partially the onus on your provider. Um, knowing how to word things and for lack of a better term, how to work the system. Um, and how to give them the exact results that they want and then showing those things with the way that you document. Um, I actually go through this on a daily basis and constant, at least once or twice a week have fights with insurance companies. Um, and so the, the better they can document things for you, um, the better off you're gonna be. But a lot of times it's, it's the words that they choose to use and also what measures they're doing um, and knowing what to write and more importantly what not to write and um, and that kind of falls on them not you but uh, one thing that's happening more and more for patients in general and for us is that um, insurance companies this year are really getting a lot worse um, and they are just flat out denying patients period um, no matter what you write I, I wrote a 10 page evaluation the other day um, on a patient and I wrote in the evaluation that this patient made these gains in the last three weeks and then had this medical setback and the values today are different than last week. I wrote everything down and the patient's uh, insurance company tried to deny her because she got worse. I'm like, well, did you read my eval? Well, no. <laughs> okay. Um, so that, that was a very fun phone call, but it, unfortunately it's it's just gonna be a battle, but knowing that knowing what your insurance company is and what limitations you have, because sometimes it's not the fact that they're denying you coverage because you're not getting better or you're not making progress. It's you, sometimes you might not fall within the scope of what they're determining your guidelines for PT are, um, and it's, it's how it's worded. So you need to be responsible for knowing that for yourself so that you can then advocate for yourself because um, you know we fight for every patient that we have, but I can't, fight a half an hour per patient because then I won't have time to do that for everybody. So, um, and then the other question you had was, oh, about the ribs. Um, so once, that's why it's important, you can't rely one on just the structural manual work and just the exercise. You have to do both. Um, and so I, for my patients, um, I, I prescribe very specific um, restorative exercises for whatever I treat that day. So if they have a specific rib or facet joint or spinal issue that day um, that we're working on, I give them a self-correction or a, a, a strengthening program for that exact effort and then tie that into their home program and their functional outcome overall. Um, but there are lots of exercises and a lot of resources out there. Just talk to your therapist about that. Next question. Also, Joanna Bean is back. So I'm if so you have sorry. any occupational therapy questions, she's here as well. Excuse me. I have a question around hypermobility in the, the SI and the, the lumbar area. And, and do you see that that leads to nerve inflammation, pain, um, other types of things? And, and can you comment on that, that a sort of linkage, especially in for EDS, hypermobile, how that might be treated? Sure. Uh, the quick answer, yes. Um, I think that the hypermobility and dysfunctions in the SI joint and the lower lumbar area are 
very significant in this patient population. It's kind of the foundation that holds your body upright. So core stabilization and um, pelvic stabilization exercises are key to preventing that from getting worse. Um, and again, it, it, there is no good answer. Um, there's a lot of exercises out there, but if you're not doing the right ones for your body, um, it can make things worse because it can cause more spasms. So you really need to talk to your therapist about what kind of problem you're having, have them evaluate it, and then put yourself on a, a, a twofold, a corrective program to correct whatever the dysfunction is to stop the problem, and then kind of a preventative if you're in pain, you need to do these exercises all the time to keep your core strong so that it doesn't happen again. Next question. I have a PT question. Um, so if you had about 20 visits and you've been in pain for like three years, at that point, do we just finally say it's just not gonna get better? No. I, I will say though, it's probably not going to improve in 20 visits. Okay. Um, so I tell my patients all the time that um, if it didn't happen overnight, it's not going to get better overnight. So that's where unfortunately it becomes slightly an insurance problem. If you only have 20 visits, you have to plan those carefully. Um, but no, it won't improve in 20 visits, but that's where you need to plan out how you're going to use those 20 visits. or. Um, we also have patients that once they run out of visits, they, you always have the option to become self-pay or you know, you have to space out those visits in between. But there, the second answer to your question is no, you, there is always hope that you're going to get better. Your insurance limitations have nothing to do with that. And speaking of insurance limitations, because this is an issue that's coming up a lot, um, as patients, it's really time for us to really push back. The Interagency Task Force on Pain is meeting again for the third time this week. And on the website, on Prodigious as some Regulations website, the common period is starting. I encourage every single patient in this room and anyone else you know, push back. Push back and make the comments so that we can finally force insurance companies to cover PT again. One of the recommendations that came out in the fall, I attended that here meeting as well, is that let's eliminate co-pays for PT, let's eliminate deductibles, et cetera. Until we as patients start pushing back, they're not gonna listen. Uh, this question is for Michelle. Um, as far as patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and many of us have the anterior cervical disectomy infusion where the trachea is actually Move. Do you see more swallowing problems with people who've had that? And is there a more common treatment or therapeutic um, plan as far as to help? It, yes, I do. I see that um, actually rather frequently. Um, a lot of times, this the trouble initially after the surgery comes from swelling um, that's resulting from the surgery. Um, the other things that can pop up in the long term is just traumatic to some of the nerves that um, have been moved out of the way. It's a rather barbaric surgery because they're essentially taking the front of your throat and they're pushing it off to the side. Um, so there are cranial nerves around that too that can have indications for um, both vocal function and for swallowing as well. Um, a lot of times it's uh, some strengthening exercises, short-term compensatory strategies, uh, but again it just depends too on you know what your swallowing looks like in that moment. Um, as long as exercise is not contraindicated um, for the individual, I typically recommend things like the effortful swallow and masako just to get those pharyngeal muscles working again um, and squeezing again. Uh, that tends to be where the greatest deficits show up where, for folks who have those procedures done. Does that help answer your question? Yes. Okay. Hi, I just have a comment regarding physical therapy. I'm 53 years old now, but from the age of eight until 45 years of age, I had right posterior subluxing ribs, which means the ribs in my back. I just thought I was cracking them for years. Um, and I finally fell on my way to really great PT um, when my shoulder completely came apart. And six, it was low and slow, six months, three times a week, almost two hours a session. And I've been pretty much sublex free for the last eight years. So it can be done. about the dysphagia that you talked a lot about uh, 
problems getting the food down. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a term for when you have problems keeping the food down, like if you eat uh, soup or ice cream, something soft, and every time you bend over, it feels like the food is back up? What do you do about that? Reflux or regurgitation. Um, it, it depends on um, you know why that food is coming up. Is there a problem with the lower esophageal sphincter? Um, is it because the food doesn't quite go all the way down? Is it hanging out somewhere in the esophagus? Is it hanging out in the throat? Is there some more other um, anatomical variation to the throat that is um, catching food? Um, there's uh, it's a rare condition that's called Zanker's diverticulum, um, but it's where there's a pocket of tissue that kind of pops out from the back of the throat, and that's where food can get kind of caught. Um, I'm not going to say that, I don't want to put that out there just to be like, oh, well, everyone has one, but um, it, it, that's where um, a, a good evaluation and a good uh, gastroenterologist, too, uh, can come to play as part of that team and figuring out why is that food coming back up? Is there a dysmotility with the esophagus as well? Um, so that's kind of in my differential when someone tells me I have foods coming back up. Those are some of the questions that are going to be coming up in my head. Right, it's not really an acid thing. I was just wondering yeah. if there be very likely it could be, yeah, yeah. And that would be a good uh, GI doctor as well that can, that can take a look at that as well. Yeah. We have time for one more question. So this is also how we do with dysphagia, I guess. Um, I was um, really glad to see all the mechanics of the tongue and stuff. And I just wondered, is there some issue, is there some cause for the tongue to get up too high and just like... Sometimes when I swallow, and sometimes when I uh, swallow, I guess even liquid, it could just the tongue just hit the top of my mouth like really hard and kicks my head back. Um, I, it could be um, it, it could be a sensory um, issue there. It could be that hypermobility um, as well. Um, if um, as far as treatment goes, and I would have to see what that looked like on a swallow or I have dystonia too. Okay, yeah. Oh, that makes that makes sense. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that, that that is possible that that can happen. Um, as far as again, as far as treatment goes, you know, it, I'd like to see that on an uh, evaluation. See if we can replicate that. Um, did that help answer your question? Yeah. I'd like to thank Joanna. Milan, Michelle, and Patricia for their time today. We'll give them a nice round of applause.